Welcome back. You're watching Street Smart. The U.S. economy has grown for six straight quarters, and Fed directors say the economy continued to improve in February and March. But our next guest says we're just in the embryonic stages of the recovery, which is still very vulnerable to a relapse. With almost 30 years at Morgan Stanley, Steve Roach has built a reputation as one of the most influential economists on Wall Street. Now following three years in Hong Kong as chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia, he is now back home and serving as non-executive chairman. He's also a senior lecturer at Yale. He's keeping pretty be busy. Uh, Steve, good to have you back. Great to see you, Carol. So you're back here in the U.S. I mean, where do you think we are in terms of the U.S. economy? There's a lot of debate about whether or not we're well on our way to recovery. You say what, the early stages are here? Look, you know, the, the, the key uh, point to, to think of, Carol, is that we went through a horrific crisis. And the history of post-crisis recoveries is amazingly clear. They're weak and they're fragile. Mm. And so if bad things happen, uh, when you're growing at a slow uh, and vulnerable pace, uh, the risk of a relapse is a distinct possibility. And I'm not saying we're going to you know, go back down again, but you know, there's a lot of shocks. Mm -hmm. uh, but that well, are, some would say we've weathered a lot of shocks that, that continue to kind of come our way, whether it's what's stuff going on in Europe, stuff going on in Japan. That we uh, seem to the weather. jury's out on you know, whether or not you want to put the past tense on the word weathered. Uh, the, the confluence of Japan, mm -hmm. sovereign debt issues in Europe, $100 oil, the social unrest in North Africa and the Middle East, any one of those is probably not enough to derail the global economy or the U.S. economy. It's the combination uh, that worries me. We still have uh, uh, the U.S. consumer, the most vulnerable sector uh, in the United States, um, I think in, in, in major need of balance sheet repair. And that, that's a big issue going forward. When you say that there's still the potential, Steve, for a rela relapse, I mean, are you saying 20% chance, 50% chance? I mean, what? This is not astrophysics. I'm saying that the markets up to, what, 100% in, mm -hmm. in the last couple of years have dismissed the possibility of a relapse. And I'm telling you, do so at your own peril. Whether that's a 25.8% chance or a 36.3% chance, I don't know. How much of whether or not we go into a relapse is contingent on what the, what the Fed does? I mean, again, the debate's over there. Should the Fed continue with its quantitative easing programs? I mean, if, if the Fed stops, Steve, at this point, is it almost a guarantee that we fall into some kind of relapse? Is, it, no, is it that there, fragile, there, no, the economy? There are no guarantees, but let, let's face it. Uh, the Fed and their, their pals on the other side of Washington, the fiscal authorities, have got the U.S. economy on steroids. And steroids are dangerous to your health. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you know lo lo look at the record of, I mean, take a look at Barry Bonds. I mean, it's not a pretty sight. Uh, and the, the risk is that when we withdraw the life support measures of quantitative easing, open-ended fiscal stimulus, what do you got? You got a weak labor market that's not generating much in the way of labor income. How do you keep the economy going on that basis? So then what do you say about, I mean, is there a true disconnect between what's going on in corporate America and their healthy balance sheets and they're going out and doing M&A deals and they seem to be okay and corporate earnings seem to look okay versus, again, Main Street that are still, that's still struggling? Compa it, companies seem to be pretty healthy uh, in, terms of, in, in terms of cash flow, but... Um, it, it's not enough to get them to go out and uh, expand and, and hire. And the simple reason is, is that those decisions are really predicated on their expectations of future growth in demand. Mm -hmm. And most uh, company managers that I talk to all over the world are very worried about future demand prospects for the biggest consumer in the world the overextended American consumer. So how do we fix this? I mean, if we need consumers to go out and spend, we need consumers to have jobs, at the same time they're still, got, they have too much debt on their own private balance sheets. I mean, how do you, how do you rectify this? We can't this, stand in the way of balance sheet repair. You know, we have this, this is sort of very reminiscent of what we saw uh, in Japan post-bubble, where we had a lot of special measures aimed at keeping uh, uh, zombie companies, the walking dead, mm -hmm. alive, and that postponed the necessary adjustments in Japan. What I worry about now is we're creating a whole new generation of zombie consumers in the United States, and we're preventing them from adjusting. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to encourage balance sheet repair and adjustment by overly indebted, saving short uh, um, consumers who have their mortgages underwater, 
facing a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, under uh, pressure in the U.S. labor market. Welcome back to Street Smart. Japan's economic and fiscal policy minister now says the earthquake may result in a larger hit to the economy than originally thought. So how long will Japan's recovery take and what does that mean for the rest of the world? Steve is back with us. Steve Roach, senior lecturer at Yale. And one of the classes he teaches, by the way, is called The Lessons of Japan. Should we be watching Japan very closely? I mean, you and I have talked about this Absolutely, Carol. I mean, um, here's Asia's first post-World War II miracle. Uh, grew amazingly rapidly till uh, the end of the 80s, and then since then has grown less than 1% a year. Mm. Uh, lessons, you better believe it, for the U.S., for Europe, for China, uh, and for the rest of the world. Is it really, though, that, that similar? And I think about the demographics and so on. I mean, is it really that similar, Steve, that we need to really There are differences the in the, and there are similarities, but... Um, you, know, you take you, you take the model, a mercantilist trade model, mm -hmm. uh, resting on the, on the foundation of a suppressed currency, massive buildup of foreign exchange reserves, dollar base. Sounds like China to me. A bureaucracy, an elite bureaucracy, running the industrial planning. They called it MIDI in, in Japan and China. Mm -hmm. It's the NDRC. There are a lot of lessons there, uh, and there are lessons for the U.S. I mean, China let asset bubbles, credit bubbles get out of hand. Last time I checked, so did we. Is China doing a better job, you think, in managing their asset bubbles right now? We've seen a lot of rate moves in China. I think they are. I actually I think they're very focused on uh, this whole concept of financial stability. So when their bubbles get out of hand, mm -hmm. they move more quickly and more aggressively to contain them. They did that with a property bubble. Uh, a year ago today. You know, it was interesting in your latest research note, you write about how it takes a crisis to force the power structure to rethink the core value propositions of economic stewardship. It sounds like a lot of jargon here, but tell me. Sounds <laughs> good not, to me, boy. <laughs> but tell me what you're saying. I mean, what do we need to learn? What's got to be different about the policy in the US so that we don't become another Japan? Well, you know, the, 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 the problem with, with us is, um, and, and I guess it's, it's human nature, bad things happen. We throw everything we can to prevent the adjustments from occurring. We mm -hmm. go into a recovery, the stock market's up, uh, and all of a sudden people say, ah, oh, relaxed, you know, why worry? We escaped it, we dodged a bullet. We'll kick the can down the road. I mean, mm -hmm. check the budget deficit uh, uh, debate right, uh, over the weekend. On. I mean, you know, we're celebrating because we cut, uh, you know, 1% out of total federal spending. I mean, that's a joke. Not, it, a scratch on the surface. I mean, but it's an embarrassment for for the politicians to proclaim victory over the the, the deficit problem. I mean, I'm personally, as an American citizen, uh, embarrassed over that. Can we? All right. You talk about you know the potential of a relapse for the U.S. economy. Can we afford though to make the necessary cuts in the spending that we're doing in our government without causing the economy to turn into a significant downturn? Can we can, we, we can afford to put in place a strategy that is aimed at a much more prudent approach Longer to both here. fiscal and monetary policy uh, over the next three to five years. In times of weakness, we know it's not, it's not rocket science. In times of weakness, you don't want to, to go restrictive on either fiscal or monetary policy. But as the economy recovers gradually, you've got to wean uh, the, the, the patient from these steroids. They're very hazardous to long-term health of any patient or economy. When can the weaning begin then, in your view? Is it something we can start right away or are you saying in a couple of years? I mean... You know, if, the, if the recovery is uh, on course, I'd say easily by the second half of this year, not too far from now. So not too far away. No. We've got and to we, don't know. we don't have to wait till the unemployment rate gets down to some uh, uh, low level or, or, or you know, we, we can... Policy operates with lag, so we have to anticipate future improvement in the economy. Well, you know, do you think the Fed is smart enough at this point and willing to take the risk, the political risk, of take, making the necessary moves in terms of raising rates at this Carol, point? Carol, the Fed is smart, but you asked the right question. Are they willing to take political risk? On paper, we have an independent central bank. They should... <coughs> be more than willing to take political risk, but they don't seem like they want to do that. Mm -hmm. That's true of Alan Greenspan, and that's true of Ben Bernanke. They're captives of the political climate. So then do you have a lot of respect for what the ECB is doing right now in terms of raising rates? Actually, they, I do. I actually, I, I really do. They're, um, they're, they're moving against the grain, mm -hmm. uh, and they're doing it in a... I think a judicious and incremental fashion. It's not too early. You're not worried about that. We've, we've had people on who said it's too early. 25 basis points. What they're doing, though, is they're setting up a, uh, an exit process that is absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. What the U.S. is doing is we're leaving emergency po our policies at emergency settings, 
after the emergency is over. Mm -hmm. Isn't that exactly what we did in the 2004 to 2007 period post equity bubble? That's what set us up for the, uh, the credit crisis, the property bubbles. We're playing the same movie again. But again, Steve, if we're still in somewhat of a fragile economy, we don't need to leave those, those steps, those extraordinary measures still in place a little bit longer. I'm, I, I'm in favor of moving back to more normal policy settings, both fiscal and monetary. I would not call that a tightening. Mm. I would call that a normalization. And if it means taking us off extraordinary life support measures, I think that's a risk well worth taking, not right now, but, but pretty darn soon. Just got about a minute left. So, you know, when you look around the globe at this point, I mean, what is the region that worries you the most here? I'm still worried about um, uh, the U.S. and um, uh, a fragile post-crisis recovery. I think Japan is back in recession again. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a challenging environment. I heard your guest on before extolling the virtues of emerging markets. I think you've got to be careful in extrapolating uh, recent growth into the future. Emerging markets, whether they're China, India, anyone else, they're faced with a lot of challenges. and, and um, China is about to make a dramatic move in transforming its growth model mm -hmm. to more of a consumer-led model, and that is a big, big challenge. All right, we'll keep an eye watch on that. So many things, Steve. Thank you, as always. We appreciate thank you, Carol. Good to see you. Great to see you, Steve Roach. Everyone.